now, yes, we can officially start. Continue. So welcome to the third, I think, um, seminar uh, of um, this cluster, Religion um, Change and Challenge. And we are very delighted to welcome Professor Shamil Khan. Um, he's a professor on medieval history at the University of Glasgow, as probably all of us now know. And um, his scholarship extends over the past three decades and broadly centering around popular in insurrection in medieval and early modern Europe, as well as on the history of plague and other diseases from antiquity to the present. So that's actually a very long period of time you're covering from antiquity to the present. And, and some work is interdisciplinary um, to its core, and he has been collaborating with medical anthropologists on comparative projects on cholera, plague, and Ebola, hmm, with an geneticist on the Black Death and syphilis and gonorrhea. Sorry, I don't know. How gonorrhea. To Oh, gonorrhea. Oh, gonorrhea. So that's what in, in 18th century Scotland. Mm. And Professor Conn has published numerous articles in more than one language on the history of plague and the social, economic and political consequences. There is a long list of one publication, but I'm sure um, probably some of you already know um, many of them. And then those can probably check the list online as well but it's just to mention the recent book the most recent book is epidemics hate and compassion from the plague of athens to aids again like that's quite a long period published into 2018 by oup and the forthcoming publication including um, popular protest and ideals of democracy uh, which confront another plague of our times the death of democracies that's an interesting take of um, death as well. So, um, so here in Glasgow, Professor Korn has utilized the remarkable University of Glasgow special collections with books and pamphlets on syphilis from their earliest appearances in 1495 to 1820 to investigate the medical, social and emotional history of the disease over 300 years. Yes, it sounds like um, you always um, tackle something very long period of time, like over a period of time. That's very interesting to know that. And actually, I didn't know that Glasgow collects 246 pamphlets on syphilis. Um, they will serve as the gateway to explore the emotional life of this disease in broader context as well. So thank you very much for joining us and um, to offer this depth and breadth and also length um, of period as well. And that seems to be very timely um, now in the current pandemic. And so we are going to listen to uh, some of your work in a research seminar on plague. Sorry, I forgot to put the actual I'll tag it. here. I'll Can you put the <laughs> Thank you. Yes, the post Black Death century decline of economic inequality and its consequences. So I get that like, 30 40 minutes of talk and then we can have discussion uh, later on. Would that be okay? Thanks, thanks very much. And I hope that my tendency for being a long durayist dur uh, won't. Uh, uh, won't extend my lecture to the long durée. Uh, so, uh, but this is is a, a very much of a, a, a work, a work in, in, in progress. It's a work in progress uh, that I hope to develop, in fact, into a, a, a big research project, but uh, maybe those are, are distant dreams. Uh, this is first and foremost, a topic on uh, inequality studies. And if I could, very briefly, I would like to uh, outline uh, the, the sort of historiography of, of inequality. Uh, it, uh, it begins with Karl Marx and uh, Ricardo in the mid 18th century and their outrage about increasing uh, inequality. And indeed, uh, this was a, a continuation of a steady progression of inequality uh, that didn't turn around until 1911. And in a very sort of perfect, perfect, way, Marx uh, realized 
that this period really began in the late Middle Ages. And he called the uh, mid uh, 15th century in England, the golden age of, uh, of, 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 uh, of the peasantry and really of equality. Um, the, by the end of the 19th century, inequality studies sort of disappeared, and curiously disappeared, and wasn't reawakened until another very different equality, inequality regime in the 1950s with the Nobel Prize winner, uh, uh, Simon Kuznets, who wrote this a remarkable article in 1955, which is really a classic article in, uh, in economic history, and which he saw inequality in a completely different way from Marx and Ricardo, not as a horrible thing of uh, cruelty, uh, of greed, but as a great advantage, as a great uh, uh, sort of boost for uh, productivity and, uh, uh, and, 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 and increase, uh, increase in wealth. And he had an optimistic view of this turning around in other places to extend uh, equality in a second wave. Um, and people believed them and so they started questioning him and after the recession of 1973. Curiously, the recession of 1973 and the racing inequality of the 1980s really didn't awaken uh, a renewal of, of and a reversal of Kuznick's, Kuznick's until uh, around uh, 2010. And then after the next recession uh, that we are still, in a sense, uh, living through in, 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 in 2008, uh, there's been a real uh, uh, blast of new research, uh, mainly by economists and, uh, and political commentators, but also his, historically. It's most, uh, I imagine that most of you have heard of one of, one of these titles, which is the uh, bestseller by Thomas Piketty, Capital in the 21st Century, which came out first in French in 2013. And this is much more than the title indicates. Uh, uh, Piketty is uh, also an economic historian, and his uh, view uh, really begins uh, about the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, once, maybe with a reference or two, he gets back into that hazy period of the long past, and he mentions the French Revolution but he doesn't go back any further than that. Now, less well advertised uh, is uh, someone in, in at Milan at the uh, Bocconi Business School in Milan named uh, Guido Alfani, who's a demographic and economic historian, who was working on this problem uh, uh, about the same time as Picardy in, in around 2008, 2009, and uh, published an article, uh, I think a really interesting article, uh, on uh, on uh, a town in uh, north uh, western Italy, uh, Ivrea, uh, which has records going back, tax records going back to uh, around 1300 before the Black Death. And from this, he won a big ERC grant of one and a half million euros and put together a very large uh, international equipe of, uh, of economists of demographic uh, historians and demographers that stretched uh, from the over the Middle East uh, to Holland, to England, uh, France, Spain, and I was lucky enough to be on the board of this grant uh, and uh, for five years. And uh, because I got uh, free invitations to Italy, uh, I I was in fact the only one on the board who attended all the meetings and uh, enjoyed all the dinners at the expense of the EU. Um, the um, what I will be talking about today is something that uh, this project really uncovered in a very profound way, but I will argue here at the beginning did very little with, and that has to do with the Black Death. What they discovered is that the century after the Black Death, and sometimes that century, depending on where you are, starts in 1348, immediately after the Black Death, and other areas, not until the 1370s, a generation later. But it's this Black Death century is the longest spell we can quantify in which the poor didn't get poorer and the rich richer, and that, that the gap narrowed instead of it becoming more extended. 
the second most uh, uh, important and longest period that we know of stretches from around the First World War or as early as 1911 uh, to the recession of 1933, uh, I mean 1973, and some go on and say it really doesn't start until the, the 1980s. And um, at first, a, a remark, the Black Death, uh, this exception, uh, and uh, how long it actually uh, 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 spanned, and its differences over time, and its character are things that Alfani and his, his, and his team and other associates really haven't uh, analyzed. For instance, just one point on this, and then I'll race ahead, uh, is uh, what was the character of this equality? And uh, to simplify things, uh, you really have two different types of equality. The most egalitarian societies that we know of in prehistory and in history are not such great places to live in because they are places where everyone is starving equally. Uh, those are the most profound uh, 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 where the so-called, where the Gini coefficients have a perfect 45 degree angle of equality. Um, the other sort of equality is what the Black Death, I think, becomes in most places only really towards the end of the 14th century, more than a generation after the Black Death. And that is, it is, it is uh, 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 the result of non-elites becoming more prosperous with, and we can check this with all the stat data of what their spending habits were or what their wages were. And this is what I've been doing uh, or have been doing er er earlier, looking at other types of material to analyze this Black Death century. Um, now, what the other characteristic, not only of Alfani and his group, but really of, of the economist and uh, of uh, those like Picardy until perhaps his latest book that just came out in English in, in 2020, uh, they really don't peep beyond uh, economics, or at least not much. Uh, and they don't look at other spheres of equality and inequality, such as political status, uh, rights, or uh, other aspects, other social spheres. Um, and uh, I don't know anyone who has, uh, except perhaps Picardy, and, and in the press, you get these notions, for instance, now with our present, uh, our present uh, 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 racing inequality since, uh, since really uh, the, the 1973, uh, that uh, things such as the, what, what uh, Pierre Bourdieu calls uh, social or, or, or cultural capital, these things parallel. Education, for instance, is a parallel and up to have, help understand increasing in, 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 in inequality. Uh, and this is really one point about Picardy's latest book, which is well over a, a thousand pages. So if you want to disprove me, you've got to go and read a thousand pages, uh, in which um, uh, uh, the, the, the notions of ideology and post colonialism, these things buttress this inequality and i'm not critiquing that uh, what i'm talking about is what happens in the black death which is and after the black death which is a different story and these are what i call the paradoxes of really declining equality and the first sphere i worked on earlier uh the first sphere was politics and it's very interesting in studies uh for instance florence of uh, and, and london what we see against this backdrop uh, in uh, uh, a rising, uh, first rising equality and then rising equality and prosperity for laborers, even and especially unskilled laborers, and then percolating into uh, uh, the uh, grayer area of the middling sorts of shopkeepers and uh, uh, petty merchants uh, is a loss of political rights. And you see this in London, and you see this in Florence, which were the two places I started with. And uh, no one talks about this against the backdrop of the Black Death. These are studied in isolation, except perhaps prosperity, but the notion of equality and the, this loss of political rights 
which uh, have to do with rights in, in their guilds and have to do with rights in Italy in large uh, assemblies, uh, legislative assemblies, uh, uh, where they are pushed out and where even the republics like Florence, Lucca, and especially Venice become much more uh, uh, oligarchy uh, regimes uh, in which uh, the uh, uh, laborers uh, have no official voice. This is a consequence of uh, the uh, of this black death e economic equality. <clears throat> and I then trace this. This is in an article that no one will read and hidden in a place, but I don't think I've ever spent as much time on an article as this one uh, that explored this 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 paradox of economic and political economy uh, 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 inequality. Sorry, uh, the um, I went and looked at places in Sweden and Spain uh, and uh, Cologne, parts of Germany uh, and uh, uh, and across Italy, and found very few exceptions to this. The biggest exception was in Lisbon. But I won't go on, on to that. Uh, the I'll just say that uh, there are two things that still really I find uh, rather rather striking is that these uh, um, moments and these political developments have been largely studied in isolation without any con any connection with the economics or with the demographic crisis of the Black Death and subsequent, subsequent uh, plagues. Now, I would like to talk to, this is the realm that I'm working on now. Uh, and I call it the uh, cultural realm. And um, I wasn't going to talk about literature, but then I, I realized that this is that I'm talking to a group in critical studies, which has to do with with English literature. Uh, and I thought I'd just mention one aspect of this, and I'll be very quick about it. And this is uh, the development of really a satirical literature in Italy. Because now my focus is, is actually narrowing. You know, usually it goes the other way around. And the po politics, I was pan European and also in the economics, but now with the cultural realm, I'm, 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 I'm focusing to begin with and probably to end with, with Italy. And what we find is, is uh, interesting. And uh, I don't guess there's anyone in Italian studies here or Italian language, and uh, it's too bad. Well, Neil is to a certain extent. But what I find is that in the 1960s and 70s, uh, this aspect of satire was, was being studied, uh, principally by two uh, great uh, uh, Italianists, uh, historical Italianists, Vittore Branca and Christian Beck from, from France, from Paris. Um, and there, um, the, the, the start of their studies was really Boccaccio. Uh, and I've tried to go back further, and um, I know there's, there's got to be satire beforehand, but you just don't see it in not sat satire uh, in, in Italy against uh, uh, the peasantry and against uh, upstarts or uh, laborers in, in, uh, in cities. And even with Boccaccio, I think it's very like uh, uh, the the problem with uh, Italian uh, literature studies, both in the period of Branca, who is brilliant, and and the, and now, as far as I can gather, and I've I've tried my best by entering key words into Regesta Imperi, and nothing comes up. The only stuff I get about Italian satire is back to the old to the old prose of Branca and Beck, and there's maybe one or two of their stu students. Uh, but Boccaccio, what strikes me by going back over with Boccaccio is that actually, in, in most of these, his, his stories, uh, which have to do with uh, city slickers and peasants, uh, and I have some listed down here, that actually the, the peasants and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, the marginals come out on top. Uh, they, they are not ridiculed. Uh, there's very little of this satire against the clergy, yes, but often, like the story of the peasant woman from uh, Varlungo, which is this little village uh, outside on the Arno, outside of, of Florence, uh, the old uh, nasty priest is, 
uh, done in by uh, the peasant, uh, peasant uh, uh, young lady who, who is much more savvy than the uh, haughty priest. And, and the haughty priest is the one who ends up in the, in the, in the bad spot at the end, no, not, not the peasant woman. Um, so, but then, and this, as far as I know, Branca and Beck never considered the trend that takes place in the uh, 14th, late 14th and early 15th century, or even into the 16th century, this literature come, becomes really nasty. I mean, really nasty. I won't give you any, uh, like, a uh, Angelo da Firenzola. I won't get into any details. It's even too much for me. But of how these peasants uh, are ridiculed, uh, beat up. Uh, in some cases, this is a 15th century story where the uh, the outsider who makes moves on a beautiful woman in Florence, and the uh, 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 and, and, and he's, he's he's just making moves in the terms of of, of, of polite conversation. I think he's he, he he's not only beat almost to death, but then all the noble kids come and piss on him while he's rolled, while he's unconscious in in the mud. And and the Firenzuola story, yeah, I can't even. Uh, it's, it's, it's too much for me. But it, this trend of really this much more vicious uh, storytelling against marginals and outsiders grows over this period uh, when uh, the laborers and uh, shopkeepers are, are profiting. And, 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 and some one of a fairly famous story is the one by, uh, by um, um, uh, Franco Sacchetti uh, uh, about uh, this story of of uh, uh, supposedly about Giotto. Uh, Deborah, do you know this story? I mean, have you ever heard of this the, the Giotto story about this uh, upstart uh, um, <clears throat> shopkeeper who's made some money and then thinks that he he goes to uh, Giotto's shop to get his uh, coats of arms painted by the great Giotto, and they, uh, you know. Uh, sneer at him and make a fool out of him, and uh, he, this is the type of development. And then with someone like Serini in the next generation, again, it becomes more vicious than uh, Sacchetti. Okay, uh, enough on, on that. I'm sorry, I went the wrong direction. Uh, what I want to go into now is my version of art history and something that I actually was doing in the 1980s, but it was sort of a sideshow to uh, a more involved uh, analysis of uh, last wills and testaments of the law of, of women's rights in one city versus another and their privileges of uh, all sorts of things about uh, uh, fetal commission or the uh, sort of this, the, the, the weight of the ancestors and how that increases in the 15th century and about religiosity, about popular piety that you find in uh, these documents. Uh, charitable bequests and how those charitable bequests change after the Black Death. One part of this, however, I was, since I was reading all these testaments, uh, almost three and a half thousand of them, um, and coding them, uh, I, I saw these these commissions embedded in the testaments for things I call art. And the more I, I think about it, actually, uh, my definition of art was pretty canonical. It's really not too different from uh, Giorgio Vasari's in the uh, mid 16th century. That is art, <laughs> artist, architecture, painting, and sculpture. Mine is bigger than that. It has to do with any type of figurative uh, uh, commissions, uh, whether it's in wax or whether it's on the on the vestments for the backs of uh, priests or cops or or um, anything which is, is figurative, even, even coats of arms and candlestick holders. Um, but most of what I found, or certainly more than half, has to do with panel painting and burial painting. Uh, and surprisingly, um, well, surprisingly, uh, actually art historians have cited me for this work, but no one's done any more work on it. I mean, I was just doing it for kicks, oh, except for one exception, and my, my friend, and Fribourg, uh, Michele, Michele Bacci, uh, is the only one. And most of it's wonderful work, and most people haven't read it, at least in, 
in the in the UK, even Italianists. Um, so um, one thing uh, that um, um, I, I found then was this real uh, downturn, and I'll, I'll get to this uh, uh, later. Is um, in in the uh, second half of the of the uh, 14th century, really, uh, and, and maybe I'll I'll, I'll get I'll, I'll do that later. But what I think is happening here are these great erasures of art, this great sort of period of 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 re early Renaissance iconoclasm, of not only uh, uh, this um, uh, blocking of uh, those from uh, laboring classes or the uh, or shopkeepers uh, uh, from uh, patronizing work in churches as sacred art, but also the destruction of this art. And um, they, um, this has been studied to a certain extent, but it's really been lodged in the 16th century. We all know about what happens there with Cosimo Il Primo and uh, Vasari as his, uh, his chief uh, commissioner, that uh, this is all governed by, so supposedly, by aesthetics. This notion of, of the Greek, supposedly Greek temples were these wonderful uh, whitewashed walls with only one or two pristine and important paintings. Uh, and the whole scheme was to get rid of all the junky clutter. And, and uh, the German art historian, uh, Martin uh, Wackenagel in, uh, in 1380, in, in, I'm sorry, in 1938, published a big book that was important on this, looking at one uh, church, the Dominican uh, church of Santa Maria Novella, and through the inventories and a lot of other digging, he found, he, he argued that until the late 14th, early 15th century, this uh, church was just cluttered with column paintings all over the place, banners, flags, little cheap tin lira or less altar pieces. Uh, and he didn't comment, however, on the social class of this art at all. And he maintained that it was, I think it's blocked out here, this was the, the spirit of the Renaissance ideal and the, the disappearance of this, this new aesthetic. And one can see, and this has been less studied, and I think needs to be much more studied, uh, earlier, earlier events of this, really in the 15th century with uh, Leon Battista Alberti and uh, Pius II, who, Pope Pius II in the uh, in the mid uh, 15th century, also uh, 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 passing church synods uh, that uh, uh, initiated this destruction of art. Um, I'm gonna go into just a few examples. I'll just skirt over these um, to just show you the sort of detail that can appear in, in these commissions. And they were commissions, that they were uh, contractually uh, uh, um, uh, met, even though the artist wasn't named yet, but had been selected. Uh, these, and we know about this because they come into the civil courts when, in fact, the church either rejects them and 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 pays good money to reject them, or they're not done, and the uh, executives uh, of the estate then challenge the church uh, for not implementing uh, what uh, uh, what they were given. Um, but here's one, uh, it's, it's uh, from 1323, a blacksmith from Mugello, which is the countryside, it's, it's a, a, a country blacksmith. These 14 lira, which is, which is pretty good for the, uh, 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 to commission a bid for the hospital of uh, the Mugello uh, Borgo San Lorenzo to care for the poor. And he wants it painted. And just think of this, you're going into the hospital and you're lying in a bed which is painted in the likeness of the majesty of God. Now, exactly what that looked like, I don't know, and I guess we'll never know. Another blacksmith in 1348 is much more elaborate, and again, from a small town, uh, uh, more than a village, but a small town, Viviana. And here he, he, he gives uh, very detailed uh, uh, instructions of which saints he wants, on which side, but the important thing is that uh, he, 
he has explicitly that he should be kneeling, uh, the testator, the blacksmith, at the virgin's feet, and labeled as such, as along with his father, and where they are are are, are to uh, be uh, positioned. The lowest uh, of any of these patrons that I've found uh, was uh, was one disenfranchised uh, Florentine uh, laborer, uh, a wool carter. Wool carters were uh, blocked from citizenship. They were blocked from joining a guild. Uh, they really were uh, the, the, the first, in many ways, I think they are the first proletariat before England or elsewhere in, uh, in Europe. And uh, yet he, at the end of his life, he must have saved his money uh, in, in 1368. He, uh, he, he orders that uh, a candlestick holder be uh, painted and inscribed with his coats of arms when he doesn't even have a family name. And, uh, and, and it makes it clear in the Testament that he's creating this family name and these coats of arms on his deathbed. Uh, and, uh, um, and, and one can go on. This one is even more uh, elaborate. And again, from someone I, I interpret from the will uh, and from where he's from is, is, a, is, a, is a peasant. And this is in a little town uh, in Umbria. And he ha orders this uh, figure of St. George, uh, it, again, to be inscribed so people won't miss the point that this is St. George uh, and then the Virgin uh, a Mary and Child and uh, his, his, his uh, father kneeling at, at her feet and holding a trumpet. And this is interesting, uh, in which he's flying the arms of the Orlandi family. Now, the Orlandi family are a big family in Perugia. And my speculation is that he was a dependent of this, this family. Yes. Uh, the even more extraordinary, I think, is the number, the percentage of, of portraits of, of, of actually requesting that these testators not only figure in these paintings, but they have to figure, uh, add symbol to, to, to the name that they should be presented in their very likeness. And I have one testament that I can't find yet uh, back, but I remember it, it uh, and, uh, uh, where uh, the, at the, the testator even, even uh, um, uh, declares that his exec, the executive of his state has to, has to inspect the final product to see if it is a, a likeness uh, to the testator. Uh, so you have this judgment at the end. Yet, in the history of, of portraiture, um, in which we get a, a new book on portraiture almost every year, a big coffee table book, they skip the Trecento, they skip this whole period of the 14th century almost altogether. Maybe they'll mean, they go from Giotto really into, uh, the, 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 into the 15th century you know, or maybe the 16th century. Uh, and nothing is said about this evidence uh, about realism of being of wanting to these, this 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 uh, desire in, in, in which is seems to me much more uh, emphatic in the in the 14th century uh, than one finds in testaments in the 15th century to be presented in, in their like in, in your very in their very likeness. Um, and here again, my numbers are, are low of 74 commissions just for burial uh, uh, paintings, 20% of the testaments demanded that they be shown or that their ancestors be, be shown in their, very, in their likeness. Um, and here I have uh, more, more e examples, uh, but I think I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll just we'll, we'll go down to the, the, the really the last one of, of this demands for being shown. This is from a woman uh, uh, who's probably uh, in the gray area of, of a um, of a, of a shopkeeper, uh, shopkeeper's uh, a wife, a widow, and and uh, she demands that she be uh, presented. Uh, I think in, in her true her for her true memory. Um, anyway, um, there are a couple of of, of, of observations and hypotheses uh, that. Uh, I could I could 
go, go into, which I think are interesting for art history and then maybe naive. One thing is I see a lot more inscriptions in these paintings, uh, didactic inscriptions uh, and, and uh, uh, than anything I ever see when I go and visit a museum today in, 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 in Italy and find inscriptions. But here, the, the, the frequency of inscriptions and the paintings to indicate what's happening, I think is, is, very, is very sharp. Well, back to equality, what this has to do with inequality and equality. Here, uh, well, I'll start with this graph, but it's maybe a little bit more simple, but the, uh, in, the in 1348, the year of the Black Death, in other words, with the commoners, this zeal for their own remembrance, to preserve their own remembrance and their family uh, parishes for their, not only their remembrance before uh, neighbors, but also their remembrance before God. Uh, this increases uh, fairly steeply through the first 50 years of the 14th century. And then uh, after 1348, it starts to decline. And then this declines very radically by uh, the last quartile of the 14th century. And they pretty much disappear. I think I have one or two, two uh, commissions coming from people who I can label as uh, usually they're, they're minor artisans like cobblers, rich cobblers or not so rich cobblers. Uh, then with the elites, we see it going in just the opposite direction. But the real takeoff is in that same quarter where you get this scissors effect. And here you can see it again with this other group, which I call the gray area, which is two things really. They're basically the uh, 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 shopkeeper groups that are, are, are of a higher status than I think uh, 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 commoners, uh, which include uh, people like furriers and certain pro procession pro professions. And uh, then those who really aren't identified by uh, commoner status, by occupation, or by titles, or by family names. And again, it's this scissors connection. It's just at the point, right here, just at the point when uh, these uh, people are prospering, that they are being pushed out of their opportunities, of their rights uh, to uh, uh, forge their own lasting remembrance and their religious ideals behind it. Um, so and just to mention that um, you've got only maybe two, three minutes to okay, yeah. work so, so that you know, we can have some discussion question afterwards. Good, Good. okay. Well, okay, let me thank you. just, uh, I'll, I'll try and, 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 and sum up. There's one thing, uh, the, um, yeah, the, 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 the mechanisms of, of uh, this exclusion have to be studied much more. The principal one is price. The principal one is that to make it into these churches after uh, 1375, you really have to give a cluster of big gifts. Uh, it's no longer these isolated column paintings of burial pipe paintings. It's stained glass windows along with livings for, for the uh, priesthood. Uh, they, they're uh, 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 things that amount into thousands of florins as opposed to five or six lira. Uh, and the other thing is, what do the uh, uh, commoners do? Uh, uh, what do they do in the 15th century? And here I, ha I, have, I have too much to say in the time that remains. Um, the, um, but um, I, I think um, the, the, the important thing is that in this inequality studies, uh, we, we see this reaction and this reaction is coming from elites. And I believe that they are, are actually doing things more than just blocking artisans to come in, but already in the 14th century, they're destroying this art, that it really is a, 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 a moment of iconoclasm, which hasn't been studied. Um, the, uh, second, uh, the, the second thing is, oh, why is this happening? And here, I think it's pretty simple, but no one has connected it. It is really this threat of those from under them for a socialist nation. And here, 
one can think of Pierre Bourdieu, but Bourdieu never studied this question in his classic of, of 1979. He never discussed it historically. Uh, and this is this threat from below because of their economic uh, advance and inequality. The elites attack in, in, in spheres that are immediately open to them. And one has to do with politics. Uh, the other, I think, has to do with the cultural religious realm. And uh, this is what I want to study. This is what I think can be studied quantitatively all over Italy from, and one can produce not hundreds, but thousands of, 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 uh, of deathbed commissions uh, that we just don't know about. It is, a, it is a, a world we have lost, and I think an important one, even for understanding the great art of the Renaissance. Thanks. No, thank you very much. It was um, very interesting, and I would be very interested to look at more deathbed commissions. And um, actually, I would love to look at you know, the one of the examples of you know, Black uh, Smith uh, near Florence, and his bed was adorned with the image of Gordon. Um, is there anything similar to that? No, you mentioned that you know, we, we can't really guess what kind of thing it was, but. Um, I'm sure that there, there must have been other people who adorned their bed in a similar way. So is there any kind of example we can? There are, there are painted beds and they're very rare. There's one, the probably the most important one from this period is in Pistoia, which I've never seen, but it's there. Uh, and there are others, but I've never seen one, you know, being uh, presented in the arms of God. Uh, I have another one that's, uh, again, it's one of the, uh, of a bed of the Holy Ghost. Now that would be some nightmare. I don't know. <laughs> the, uh, so it's um, it's it's um, uh, but very few of these beds survive. And also, I have to say that in the commissions, <coughs> they're fairly rare. They're fairly rare. Okay. Yes. Um, as Ophira mentioned uh, in the chat, um, if you have any question, just raise your hand. Or some people maybe in the library and can't speak. In that case, please uh, just put your. Um, question in the chat and actually who was the first Maybe. okay Deborah <laughs> that's a great talk Sam and a wonderful project and it's so interesting that these volumes that discuss portraiture leave out this century so I had a kind of two-part question related to that um, one is do you think it might have something to do with formal definitions of what a portrait is on stylistic grounds and formal grounds, you know, because there is a line within art history that what was happening through most of the Middle Ages uh, wasn't really a portrait. You can't call it that because it's idealized. So, in other words, taking a very technical artistic definition of portrait, meaning a likeness that the eye sees, as opposed to some other thing that or, or figure that obviously maps onto an individual but stylistically isn't individualistic. So that's the first part. And then the second part is, what kind of a relationship is there between the records that you've got of these various commissions and survivals? Because art historians tend to like to write about stuff that's still here. Yeah. So yeah. that's another way of, yeah. you know, worrying about what's going yeah. on. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Deborah. Uh, two things. So maybe to start with the, the second, uh, I think the reason that these last wills and testaments have almost uh, been totally neglected. They haven't been totally neglected. The only time you really see, except for Bacci, the only time you see people going into these testaments is when they have the object. And then they, uh, then they go searching for uh, contracts first and notarial documents. Right. And then they go check, he, he finds some, and there's some remarkable things. I mean, there's that one long article that came out maybe 10 years ago on the, on the Perugino uh, uh, of the piece, which um, was in fact uh, uh, commissioned by a carpenter, in which we have both the contract and the last will and testament and the object. But this is extraordinarily uh, rare. Yeah. Uh, about idealization, uh, well, first of all, I would say that aren't all portraits idealizations, even the ones with warts and all, and then, you know, they, there is a lot of attention to the, uh, 
to the well the first part of it to, to Jocko, you know. So what is the difference between yeah. Jocko's images and and the one I have at the beginning by Barna the uh, uh, Siena? I mean, in fact, I think that uh, yeah, my, that's... my naked eye says that that's as, as good a, a painting of a of a of a, of a, of a of a human being is 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 Jado then. I mean, yeah. Know, I mean, that, that, that kind of answers it, although I would say there's a difference between flattery and idealization, since idealization oh. tends to be a stylistic term that means conventional, effectively, as opposed to something that just makes you look good. But yeah, if they're talking about Giotto, I can't see why, you know, they would skip. But, but this is, you see, Deborah, I think this uh, gets his where the, uh, where the words uh, tell us something about intentions that we can't tell always from the objects. And, and here it is very clear that these people want to be represented in their very likeness. Mm -hmm. In that one case, which I now can't find, the guy where he even puts up his, after he's in the, in the grave, he wants his, his executor to uh, assess whether this is in his likeness. Yeah, so and of course there were different ideas about what that meant at the time. Yeah. So it's not imitatio necessarily, is it? It's not. Imitatio, you know, it's oh, it's I not uh, yeah. It's it's I think it is, you know, um, the idea that uh, something can be a true likeness, but not necessarily look exactly like it does through your natural eye. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, no, but thanks. And I do think, and here, I, I, I'm glad you said it first, but I think that um, art historians uh, have been too attached, and not always too attached to what exists, what survives. And don't ask about what has been destroyed. It's what we like, Sam. <laughs> but, but the other thing, the other thing is, in our day and age, I think understanding destruction, iconoclasm, is very important. Oh yeah. And, and yes. Um, yes, I, I still see like a couple of more questions. So can we just um, do the first? So oh, Matthew, sure. maybe. Uh, I think I think uh, Ophira was Ophira first. Was first. Okay, Ophira. Ah, oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, let's represent the religious studies a little bit here. Uh, actually, I really heard a lot about religion in your talk, <clears throat> but uh, just to uh, get back to the point of erasure and iconoclasm, I kind of started scribbling a little bit here and there. Uh, you started your lecture with Marx, and I was wondering uh, whether there is not a little bit of room for Gramsci in this respect. Uh, because it sounds like this kind of erasure that you were talking about um, has a lot to do with <coughs> hegemonic uh, structuring or restructuring of, you know, of the culture and the, the position around it. So really, I'm far from being any expert on any of these issues. And by the way, really thank you for this very, very rich and um, interesting, fascinating presentation. It was a bit difficult for me at least to follow <laughs> with all the terms and nice names part. that 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 I don't you know I don't know anything about this history but it sounds like there is this uh, process of hegemonizing or re-hegemonizing or reclaiming art uh, by the elites just just a random thought and back to religion you know I think if you and I keep on kind of repeating it in my mind also uh, if we step aside from thinking about religion as belief or faith or something that is in the inner experience of, of people, but think about religion as a system of organization, social organization, and especially in the context of, of uh, uh, disaster management or disaster risk reduction or rebuilding society or community after disaster strikes, then we can view religion from a slightly different perspective that is very relevant. So it's probably not a coincidence that the commissioned works had the person, the, the people commissioning them uh, kneeling uh, and selecting certain figures in their, you know, in their pantheon or, you know, um, yeah, that and anyways, that was my two cents. Yeah, no, thanks, thanks. Uh, no, in fact, well, uh, two things come to mind. I mean, well, one, yes, the, it's still, I think, very important that the Black Death sets off of this uh, new regime of, of, of control. Uh, and you see it most blatantly in the in 
politics and the uh, and the destruction of a certain type of associative uh, uh, organizational behavior on the political level for non-elites. On the other hand, however, and one thing, because I, I went on too long about things at the beginning that I probably should have ditched, uh, I uh, has to do with the reactions of uh, the non-elites uh, to this new world. And one way in which they continue uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, express themselves in their own churches was through uh, organization, through religious confraternities. Now, no one's plotted this out. And I think there, there are some studies by art historians, much more about uh, commissioners from uh, non-elites who come at, from, uh, who do it collectively through their confraternities, because that way they can afford these big donations that go from uh, five lira or 10 lira to 200 florins, which in florins in the 15th century is four times uh, the four lira. So, and, and, and this, uh, this is an organizational part of religion that, again, hasn't been treated quantitatively. I mean, it seems to me, based on the, the uh, secondary literature, that this is indeed increasing, uh, increasing rapidly in the late 14th and 15th century at this, at this same moment. Uh, so organization comes into it. It's, uh, Thank you. Um, maybe the last question, uh, Matthew? You. Hi Sam, thank you. That was really great. Um, just, just one thing to pick up on, on. I was struck by your examples of the of the bequests. How many times these non-elites are claiming to have coats of arms? Yeah, yeah. And, and is is this a development in its own right? Because it's so that's that's is does the 14th century see a rise in non-noble families trying to claim arms? And, yeah. and is there a, is there um, a pushback by the aristocracy against it. Is that part of your iconoclasm that they're actually trying to regulate who is who is allowed to bear arms and that's another form of visual policing of, of status? Yeah. Well, one thing is, uh, I think in, in uh, these, uh, the, the Italian city-states, it's certainly uh, coats of arms aren't, aren't uh, the monopoly of the nobility but they usually are the monopoly of the nobility and the merchant merchant mm -hmm. elites. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it is a, a, a curiously a cheap way to, uh, to leave your memory. Uh, and sometimes your name is inscribed as well as on your coats of arms and you invent your coats of arms. And we see it first and uh, foremost in uh, satirical literature. I mean, it's a famous Aketi story, but there's others like the one by, by Giovanni uh, Pontano, uh, the uh, of of you know the uh, the uh, how how dare these uh, non elites think they can produce a, a a coat of arms and then how ridiculous it is and the the story about Giotto and by Sacchetti you know it just keeps on rubbing it and rubbing it in to this poor guy first of all he brings his shield in and he and Giotto sort of snickers and gives it to the apprentice and the apprentice he says just put every cliche, uh, you know, uh, emblem on this. And the guy comes back and he sees this horrible mess and starts complaining and they call the police. And then the, who do you think the police uh, uh, sides with? And, and uh, they, yeah, so it's, it, it, it is this, it's this whole mockery of these upstarts. And it, it, that's known about that, uh, and, uh, but it's, uh, really about coats of arms, I think, and uh, how prevalent these coats of arms were, I think, to take your point, uh, I think is sort of un unknown to, uh, uh, to historians uh, for the 14th century in places like Florence. Because in England, I mean, there is an attempt to actually prohibit yeah. non-nobles from bearing arms. I mean, so there is a, there's a visible reaction by the, by the 14, 1400s, 1410s. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, that, but, but obviously, that's, that's a more centralized kingdom, and you can police it better. But so well, in the city think, states, I so think it's probably going on. You see, people haven't studied uh, the, the the municipal uh, uh, decrees looking for this stuff, or or the church synods. So that's great about that. I like the reference for for England because sure, it's the sure. 15th century. Well, that would make a great project, wouldn't it? 
this is really at the at the breaking point. Why then? And I think it is the economic threat. It's a, it's the economic threat, but it's really more of a psychological threat. And here, Gordur comes in. You know, it's distinction. They need to distinct. Distinction and and in fact, people like Goldsweith and a lot of art historians have uh, talked about this in Florence, for instance. But they don't give it. The, it's sort of a universal, you know. It's not something that is produced and or argued in terms of time. And this is what I'm doing from what you know what I find. I mean, you know, as you know, Matthew, I'm a vulgar empiricist. I, uh, uh, oddly. <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, I think this is about time. And um, and also, it was very interesting. Um, you know, you you say that I'm um, trying to look at what was destroyed and what hasn't survived until now, especially you know when we are looking at medieval time. Um, I'm a medievalist, and you know, trying to focus on the texts which are extant, and because you know the texts which are not here, it's hard to explain. But at the same time, you know, there's more. Um, study on oral tradition or like a music and how cultural interchange um, was expressed through music from medieval times. So like, you know, there's probably more and more study on that. But um, yes, I'm very much looking forward to uh, the result of your father, or findings of your father's study and this um, deathbed um, commission as well. And so thank you very much for this fascinating talk. And I've got like all sorts of images in my mind and with the bet adorned with the God. And so it was very interesting. And thank you very much for all the questions. And no. so we don't have the date for the next um, talk yet, but um, once we know, uh, we will advertise through the uh, usual channels as well. Thank you so uh, much. It was really, really Sam, yeah, it was yes. great. Thank inspiring. You. Yeah very inspiring how to study the history of the little traces that are left there that nobody pays attention and this is something I'm kind of obsessed with uh, from my little world the corner of the world that I'm studying I, no 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 don't tell me there is no evidence there is but you should start looking you know elsewhere and not under the lamp you know <laughs> the key is somewhere in the house in the darkness so yeah, yeah thank you no, very much for that one as well yeah yeah. So, thank you very much. Um, maybe, yes, we should close here. Yes. So, uh, so I, I stopped the recording and yes. uh, uh...